it is my great pleasure to introduce today uh, John Black from the University of Colorado, Boulder. And uh, he's going to tell us about some recent attacks on MD5. Okay. Thanks, Christine. Um, as Christine said, my, uh, my talk is about MD5. And I'm, my name is John Black. Um, I don't really know what to assume about this audience. So uh, when I wrote my talk, I sort of assumed that you had some exposure to some security primitives, block ciphers, and hash functions, and so forth, but that you're not intimately familiar with uh, how they work um, and the recent attacks that have been mounted against them, and so forth. So is that is that a fair assumption? Yes? OK. So for those experts in the audience, I apologize in advance for boring you for the first bit of the talk. Um, I was told I could make this interactive if I wanted to, so I'm going to. Let's start with a question. So here's the, here's the setting. You have this great scientific discovery. You um, have figured out how to factor products of large primes in constant time, polynomial time. Or uh, that P doesn't equal NP and you have a proof. Something like this. Really, a really big, big deal. But you're not really ready to reveal this to the world yet because it's, maybe there's some problems or you have to flesh out some more details and so forth. And at the same time, you don't want to sit on it for two months while you work out the details because somebody else might come up with the same idea, beat you to it, and you get zero credit. So what do you do? So that's my question to you. What do you do? Very good. Okay, so yeah, so you could hash it, meaning you use a cryptographic hash function, take the digest, the output, and publish it in the New York Times or something, right? And the idea is that you're not revealing anything about the actual contents of your result because you only published the hash, and these things are supposed to be one way. And also, you've committed. You can't change. Why can't you then change later on your document to claim you actually knew more once somebody else publishes something extra? Because The hash would change almost certainly, not necessarily, right? If there's a collision, it wouldn't change. But almost certainly, if you make any change at all, you're going to get a different digest. And it should be hard, according to the security of these functions, to do that. But I'll, I'll go some over what, more detail of what I just said in just a minute. The old way that you would do this is you would mail yourself a copy of it and then use the postmark as your timestamp, right? But there's some physical properties with the security of this. This other one, assuming that the hash function is good, doesn't really have any, any problems. OK. So hash functions, that's just one application of many, many applications for these things. But what are these things? They're functions that take, we think of something large down to something small. But of course, it could be something small to something small. They take any input, any string of any size, and they output a digest or a hash of their input that has some fixed length. Okay. Um, ones you may have heard of before are things like MD4 and MD5 and SHA-0 and SHA-1 and so forth. All right, so to get a little bit more uh, into the details, when I say hash functions throughout this whole talk, I mean the cryptographic kind. I don't mean the kind where you just multiply by some number, take it mod a prime, and that's for data dictionary kind of applications. I don't mean universal hash families. I mean cryptographic hash functions. As I just said, they take any string of any length down to some fixed length. So here I'm saying 0, 1 to the star means strings of any length. And uh, the output r, the range of the function, is k bits. So we'll use k conventionally today to talk about the size of the, of the digest, how big it is. And typical uh, output sizes are 128 for MD4 and MD5, 160 for SHA-0, SHA-1, 192, 256, 512, and so forth. These, these are the typical hash function output sizes. They have a few requirements. They should be simple, portable, fast to compute. Obviously, something that takes three hours to hash you know, 10K document isn't going to be as appealing as something that doesn't lickety split. So, so all of these things have always been um, designed to be friendly to computers, run well on commodity hardware, be portable, and so forth. And also, we have some security properties that we need as well. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. So here are the security definitions. And you'll notice I put the word definitions into quotes. So maybe um, you've seen this before, or you can think about it now. 
But these definitions really aren't good definitions. And let's read through them. Um, these are the ones you'll find in your typical crypto texts. And oftentimes they forget the quote marks. They actually write them down as real definitions, when in fact they're not very good definitions. So here are the terms that, uh, that people care about with the security of hash functions. Number one, collision resistance. Okay, collision resistance means you can't find two distinct inputs that hash to the same output. If you do, that's called a collision. Inversion resistance. Given an output, given a hash digest, you can't find any input that hashes to that output. And finally, second pre-image resistance, which is if you're given an input-output pair, in other words, you're given a document and its hash, you can't find a distinct separate document that also produces the same hash function, same hash value. Okay, so open it up. Why are these really not good definitions? Christina, okay, how about in the back? <laughs> Exactly. What does this word mean, computationally infeasible? How do we define that? Um, okay, so the typical definition for computationally infeasible is as follows. There does not exist a program that runs in polynomial time that can solve this problem, okay? So let's pick on collision resistance since that's the, the thing we're going to focus on today. Collision resistance, putting this into more exact terms, would say there does not exist a program which can output A and B distinct strings that have the same hash. Okay. If we define things that way, are, are any of these functions collision resistant? Why not? Yeah, it's just purely impossible, right? So all of these functions compress large strings down to small strings. By the pigeonhole principle, there must exist a collision there are more inputs than there are outputs. So if there exists a collision, you can't make a statement like no program can output a collision. There, there does exist a, a program, the one that simply prints out a collision, right? It prints out two strings. So there does exist a program. We don't know what it is. And unfortunately, there is no set of definitions that properly captures the intuition that we want to when we say something like a hash function is secure. So all of this operates in sort of a non-mathematical, non-rigorous way when we say we're looking for collisions in a hash function. They definitely exist, we just don't know what they are, and we have to find them essentially by ad hoc methods. Okay. Nonetheless, I think it's clear intuitively what this means. We would very much like to find two distinct inputs to SHA-1 that produce the same output. And today I'm going to talk about specifically about MD5. In MD5, we want two inputs that produce the same output. And... Uh, more on that in a moment. So if we have a good hash function, it should act random. And what I mean by random, a perfect random function would work as follows. Imagine a table where down the left-hand side, you write down every possible string. So it's an infinite length table. We start out with the empty string, then 0, then 1, then 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and so forth, all strings. And on the right side, we have k-bit outputs, the digest for each of the left-hand column strings. The right-hand column should be filled in with k random bits, independently and uniformly selected from the set of all k-bit strings. Okay, there should be no interdependence. In particular, um, you shouldn't see properties like correlations between inputs and outputs. So, for example, and this is definitely what we try and achieve with hash functions like MD5 and SHA-1. So, for example, if you run MD5 on these two strings, as I've shown here below. MD5 sum is a typical Unix utility. So if you run it on the, um, the string high there, you get this uh, first hash function digest, this first hash. And if you write it on ho there, which is only two bits different in the ASCII, it looks completely different, right? It looks like completely unrelated. Certainly flipping two bits in the input doesn't just flip two bits in the output. And that's, one, that's, that's, that's certainly what you would expect from a random function and is a definite requirement on these kinds of hash functions. 